What's the point of praying? Nothing ever changes. Why does she get to have a nice new car and I have a piece of junk? I really don't like that person. I have a plan for my life and nothing will get me off track. If God put this in front of me, he must want me to have it. I know my Bible front to back. God must be so proud of me. Does God even care that this hurts? I bring my kids to church. What more could God want from me? I earn this money. I get to decide what I do with it. God, I swear I will never do that again. Sure, I believe in God. What more could he want from me? Well, good morning, church. My name is Steve Musto. I'm one of the pastors here. Glad that you are here. And uh, for those joining us online, welcome as well. We are going to be celebrating communion uh, together. So fair warning to those who might be watching from home or whatever. Go gather uh, elements now. Raid the pantry. And uh, we'll enjoy that together. Before we dive into uh, James chapter 3... Uh, some of you may remember this story. Uh, there was, uh, in, in Tampa in 2017, uh, there was actually a serial killer that the Tampa uh, police had been hunting for quite a while. And uh, when they made an arrest in that case, they called a press conference. This is something that is often done. And uh, here's a picture of uh, the, the press conference. And uh, over on your left there is Derlin Roberts. Derlin uh, was the one who, uh, when they asked for a sign language interpreter, someone who knew ALS to come in and to sign, uh, as we've seen in, in press conferences a lot, she's the one who showed up. Here's the problem. Derlin didn't actually know sign language. And so uh, what you had was for most of us, you had something that looked like sign language, but for those who know, for those who rely on uh, American sign language to get their information, what she was signing was essentially gibberish. At some point in, in time, she hit on a couple things that were, uh, that were signs, but that was, that was about it. It was confusing. This is not the only time this has happened, by the way. Nelson Mandela's memorial service also had a very similar thing happen. Someone came up on stage purporting to be a sign language interpreter. They were not. Now, it might seem like it's almost a prank gone awry. Like, we're not, we don't, should we be offended by it? Should we not? But think about it. If that's the way you get your information, if that's what you need to get information, and that's the only information you're getting, think how, like, offensive that is. Like, am I being teased? Am I being made fun of? Like things are not already difficult enough living in a hearing world when I don't have my full hearing capacity or any at all? Or, or is it really someone trying to lead me astray? We still don't actually know why Derlin did this. She just did. But uh, we're safe in saying that she was a fraud not who she claimed to be. Many people who are purporting to dispense wisdom from God are frauds. They're not who they actually claim to be. They're rabbis, they're teachers who don't really know Christ. That's what they would have been called in the first century. They would have been called rabbi or teacher. And the problem was that they were showing up to churches and they were claiming to have a message from God or they were claiming to know what Jesus would want the church to do. And they were claiming to, here's how we interpret the law today based on the death and resurrection of Christ. And, and they would show up to these churches, they would begin to teach. But this is not a problem that just plagues the ancient world. It actually plagues our world. 
How do we know whether someone we're listening to represents Christ? How do you know whether to listen to me week by week? How do we know whether in our own lives we're representing Christ accurately? Because if we don't have discernment, we are going to be led astray or we're going to lead other people astray. So in the New Testament world, knowledgeable and educated people were arrogant. Uh, this was not just like most of them were. It, it was actually kind of your job to be arrogant, to uh, make sure that you lorded it over those who were beneath you. This is a very stratified society. And so those at the top, the aristocracy, the ones with money, the ones with power, the ones with influence, whatever it might be, made sure to keep the next level down at bay, who kept the next level down at bay and all, all, all the way down uh, to slaves, and everybody just treated slaves terribly. It was expected that if you had knowledge, if you had wisdom, if you had schooling, if you had anything like that, you were going to treat people with arrogance and condescension. If, if you've ever read the accounts of Jesus interacting with the religious leaders, and they kind of come across as arrogant jerks. It's because they were acting like arrogant jerks. That's why. That was kind of what was expected of them. Aggression, ambition, jealousy, arrogance, those were lauded as attributes. If you were arrogant, well, you must know a lot. You must be important. And so when teachers came into the early church, many of them attacked one another aggressively and defended themselves aggressively against others. When did this change? <laughs> we, in our world, we value humility, don't we? We don't like it when our leaders are less than humble, at least most of the time. We, we like to, we hear stories of like celebrities or whatever, who when we find out, oh, they're just like a humble person. We like those stories. Because our culture values humility. This is a culture that looked down on humility. When did it change? Uh, John Dixon is a um, scholar who decided to try to track this. When, when did everything change? How, how is it that humility, which was so reviled and despised in the world, uh, how did it become something that we value today? So he and a group of his grad students uh, did a, a study, a historical research, on how humility uh, came to be something that we uh, all value today. And he wrote a book. It's called Humilitas. It was written in 2018. And here's what they decided. They looked at all these religious movements, they looked at everything else, and they traced humility to a first century rabbi from Nazareth named Jesus. Jesus is the one who brought humility forward and said, this is not going to be a vice anymore, it's actually gonna be a virtue. And if you want to follow me as your rabbi, that that is what you're going to be marked by. Jesus modeled for us the way to discern whether someone is speaking with wisdom or not. James picks up that thread from Jesus, and he's going to tell us in James chapter 3, verse 13, where we can look to see if someone is actually speaking for Christ. 3.13, who among you is wise and understanding. Normally the arrogant person would be. By his good conduct, he should show that his works are done in the gentleness that comes from wisdom. So anybody, James says, who has received wisdom from God is not gonna lead with aggression. They're not gonna lead with violence, bullying, name calling, belittling. Wisdom will never show up in harsh arrogance. It will show up, true wisdom, in gentleness. 
The problem with gentleness is that in the Roman Empire, nobody wants it. Gentleness is a feminine characteristic. Women were expected to be gentle, but even when they were, it wasn't valued. It was just their ex the expectation. No man would ever want to be gentle. Ugh. And along comes Jesus, and he says, if you're going to have real wisdom, and if you're going to speak my name, if you're going to say what I am telling you to say, you're going to do it with gentleness, with humility. Look at the contrast James makes between those who speak for Christ, who are actually from Christ, and those who don't. Look at verse 14. But... If you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, well, don't boast and deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above. It's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there is disorder and every evil practice. James gives us a kind of primer on how it is that we can spot those who are claiming to speak for Christ, but actually don't. Because on their face, they would have looked just the same as everybody else. In fact, they might have been elevated a bit more than everybody else because they were arrogant, because they put everybody else down. What does James say? Here's how we spot an imposter who's claiming godly wisdom. Even if that imposter is us. The first thing is they do what benefits them. They do what benefits them. Look at the, the wording that James uses. Bitter envy, selfish ambition. We like ambition in our world. It's a good thing. Selfish ambition, not so much. This occurs when people serve their own interests. And if you listen to someone who's claiming to speak for God, and they are claiming things about the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, claiming things about the Bible, but that, whatever they're saying, doesn't seem to cost them anything. Well, wait a second. Are you really from the Lord? It's funny, these, these folks, they never have to sacrifice. They never have to forgive. They're able to hold grudges. They can use their pulpit to bully people and shout down critics. There's no turning from sin. There's no sacrificial living, no laying down of pride, no giving to the work of God until it hurts, no change in their behavior. I'm not just talking about the, you know, pastors with the suits and the, the private jets. It's others as well. They highlight God's blessing over his discipline. They highlight their own happiness over God's holiness. And when we hear them, if we hear anybody saying those kinds of things, and it seems to just only benefit them, and they're prescribing something for the rest of us that isn't what they themselves are following, they're frauds. Here's a second way we can spot them. They're proud. They're proud. That's what boasting is all about in this passage. They attack when they're confronted. They won't listen to anybody. They excuse their own sinful behavior and then they'll mock you and attack you for daring to challenge it. They'll lie about it. They'll claim it never happened. Oh, no, 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 I never did that. I, I never said that. They won't apologize because they're way too busy playing the victim to do that. When you spot that in someone who's claiming to speak for God, they are frauds. Don't listen to them. Third, they are chaotic. The wording that James uses is disorder and every evil practice. He's talking just about sin, but he's also talking about a, a, a kind of chaos 
that just swirls around them. This is a consequence of living apart from Christ. Some of us are actually drawn to their unpredictability. Well, you never know what this guy's going to say. You never know what's going to come out of his mouth. It's woo. He tells it like it is. Does he really? Or is he kind of an arrogant jerk? Uh, Around them, family, friends, employees, disciples, they're, they're frantic, they're jumpy, they're exhausted, they're afraid. If you see these folks and chaos is following them, and they're saying, hey, follow me, don't listen to them, they're frauds. The alternative that James gives is a list of true wisdom. And it's, it's a common list. It's the kind of thing that we see um, famously, Galatians chapter five, Paul has this thing called the fruit of the spirit. And it comes from Jesus. Because Jesus said, he knew he was gonna be leaving soon. And in a conversation with people, he said, you know how you can tell who my followers actually are? Watch their life. Watch the fruit that comes out of their life. That's how you know my followers. It's not what they say. It's what what they do. Watch them. And so this fruit of the Holy Spirit uh, gets listed in a few different places. Here's another uh, kind of version of that. Verse 17. The wisdom from above, God's wisdom, is first pure, peace-loving, Gentle, is that word again? Compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without pretense. Uh, Each one of these, pure, it's just sincere in obeying God, not not twisted motives, but seeking out a desire, a true desire for holiness. It's peace-loving. It produces peace in the church, produces peace in people's lives. That person shows up on the scene and the temperature in the room goes down instead of going up. They're gentle, they're non-combative, they're compliant, they're willing to learn, they're willing to be corrected. They're willing to hear how they've wounded you and they're willing to say, I am really sorry. I messed that up. They're full of mercy and good fruit. They're generous with other people. They're unwavering without Pretense. Their heart is set solely on following God, and they are humble. Jesus gave the world a completely different perspective of wisdom. The truly wise are not out for themselves. They actually work for the good of others. So, do you notice what's not here? Because in, in our world, here's what we do. Someone claims that they're speaking for the Lord. Someone has a a new ministry movement or a new perspective on something in the Bible or whatever it is. And and we tend to go, those of us who are followers of Jesus in particular, we we go towards their beliefs. Well, let me just find out. Let me really dig in to what they believe. But what's not here in this list of things that we should be looking at in the lives of people who claim to speak for God are things like theology or biblical litmus tests. You know, where, where do they fall on you know, six literal days of creation, 24-hour days? How old is the year? Like, none of those things are on the list. What do they believe about the end times? They, it doesn't say anything about needing to know the nuances of theology, of the Bible, of which is good, because here's what that means. That means we don't all have to go to seminary in order to figure out whether someone is actually talking truth about God. It's not that beliefs are unimportant, they're, they're important. It's just that we don't have to, if we don't have that understanding or that knowledge available to us, or if this person is far more schooled than we are, 
We don't have to know everything they know to figure out whether or not they're true, real, honest. God chose the simple things of this world to shame the wise. That's what God's word tells us. Jesus told us to look at the lives of his followers. Just one chapter before in the book of James, James says this remarkable statement. Even the demons believe. <laughs> you know, think, think about this for a second. Here's what he's saying. You know, you know the demons have good theology, right? They know. They know way more than we do. They've got stuff figured out. They know how stuff happened. They know, they know the Bible really well. They've got it figured out. The problem is not their beliefs. The problem is their behavior. That's what condemns them. And that's what condemns us. Here's the lesson for our lives. The people who most influence us for Jesus must act like Jesus. The people who most influence us for Christ have to act like Christ. The people whose advice and input and counsel and wisdom we follow, what do their lives look like? I'm rarely disappointed anymore when somebody who I respect or admire teaches something differently than what I believe. Because most of the time I say, well, I understand. There are really good scholars on that side of the fence and they're way smarter than me. And this person has done some research and figured this thing out for themselves and that's the avenue they've chosen. That's not what disappoints me. That's probably what, not, what doesn't disappoint most of us. Most of us are disappointed when someone when someone's life doesn't match what they say their life is. They're hypocrites. Pastor of a prevailing church had an incredible like worldwide ministry. Uh, when he came crashing down to earth, because his character was not what he said it was, uh, he wounded hundreds, probably thousands of people, but one of them I'm particularly close to it hurt him badly. It hurt his brother even more. He's not even part of a church anymore because that's the kind of destruction that can be done. I'm grateful personally for God's spirit and what he's doing in his church. You see, many years ago, if you're a pastor like I am, uh, it took a sex scandal or stealing money or something like that for you to get booted out of the church, for you to lose the pulpit, for you to undergo church discipline. But God is doing a work in his church. And one of the good works that he is doing is he's, as his spirit sweeps through churches is that he's removing the bullies too. He's removing those who say, well, this is how you're supposed to live, but they don't live that way. Removing those who treat people terribly. And when he removes them, there's this group of staff people and lay leaders and everybody else saying, thank God, I'm released. When we see people like that, we don't have to follow them because they're frauds. Paul is talking to uh, the Corinthian church and uh, is writing them a letter. One of the things that they've done is because there are so many false teachers, they've taken to requiring letters of reference. So when you come into the church, it's like, well, what are your letters of reference? We need to see these. And as Paul's getting ready to visit the Corinthian church that he built, they're like, well, Paul, what are your letters of reference? And you read this for first, in first Corinthians, Paul's like, my letters of reference, they're written on you. You saw me, I was in your midst all the time. You saw how I behaved. Did I, did I hurt anybody? Did I take advantage of anybody? Did I take anybody's money? My, my letters of reference are written on your hearts. 
Watch my life. James sums up this whole teaching in this little pithy proverb, and it's, I say this kindly, it's so good, it's probably a little too good for James. He wasn't an educated guy, and he says this thing, and there are some scholars who believe that he got it from Jesus, and that may be true, I don't know. Verse 18, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. The, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. If the people who influence us to have real wisdom, God's wisdom, are in our lives, they have to live the same way they tell other people to live. They have to do what benefits the kingdom of God over what is personally beneficial. They have to be humble, they have to be peaceful, they have to be characterized by getting along with others. They have to be gentle and reasonable, overflowing with mercy, not being two-faced. And if they don't, we need to stop listening to them. We need to stop downloading their podcasts or watching their YouTube channel or buying their books. We just need to stop because we're feeding something that isn't right. They're imposters. This applies to the people out there who are popular and well-known and whatever. It applies to all of us. It applies to me. This is another one of those passages that I preach with fear and trembling and say, hey, look, I live in a glass house. You guys need to be able to look at my life and say that it's consistent. All of us are to live that way. Whether we lead hundreds of people or just a family or a grow group or whatever it is. In 1 Corinthians, uh, while Paul is addressing a lot of issues in the church, one of the things that he addresses in 1 Corinthians 11 is um, how to take communion. And I'm going to recite uh, the words of, uh, of Paul that are really the words of Jesus uh, in, in just a few minutes as we take communion together. But the, the church is having a problem in Corinth. And the problem is that, remember those, those levels culturally? Wealthy, aristocratic people and then all the way down? Yeah, they're still treating each other that way in the church. And the cross is the great equalizer. It's the thing that made everything, everyone on the same level. But the church is having a hard time with this. And so there are people who are very wealthy and have a lot, and what they're doing is they're, they're coming in to the fellowship and they're overindulging in food and wine and and then there are folks who are coming in who haven't eaten in a day or two or whatever because they just don't have anything and they're barely getting anything. See, we're being treated unequally. And it's, it's the church doing it to each other and it's not okay. It, it's the same kind of idea as a teacher who says, yeah, yeah, follow me. I mean, I don't have to do what I'm telling you to do, but you should follow me anyway. So here's what Paul says to them from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself in this way. Let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you. Many have fallen asleep. If we were properly judging ourselves, we wouldn't be judged. But when, we were, uh, when we're judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. So we're about to take communion together, and communion is a time when we pause to reflect. 
It's a time to open our hearts and to allow the Holy Spirit to speak anything into our hearts that he needs to speak. Where are we listening, for instance, to unwise voices that sow discord instead of sowing peace? Where do we have personal ambition and we put the personal ambition, the thing that we want to do over and above church unity? Where are we being harsh instead of gentle in our lives? Let's do this. Let's go to prayer together and as we close our eyes and prepare our hearts, let's just take a moment and allow the Holy Spirit to speak anything that he needs to speak. Let's just take a few moments of silence before him. Holy Spirit, we invite you to speak to us, to tell us anything that you need to tell us into our hearts in this moment. Likewise, if there's anything that we need to confess before the Lord right now, we do not want to eat and drink judgment on ourselves, to use Paul's words. So right now, let's take a moment to confess anything that we have done this week, anything that we have, uh, any way we've treated someone else, anything our eyes have seen that should, they should not see, anything we've harbored in our hearts against someone. Having confessed these things to the Lord, I proclaim the forgiveness of Jesus Christ over all of us. That when we have come in the name of Jesus through his blood, we have confessed our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you for that cleansing. Thank you for the cross, Lord, where we remember what it is that Christ has done for us. So as we take of this together, may we stay in that moment of reflection. We pray in the name of Jesus and for the sake of his reputation, we all agreed and said, amen.